The goal is to densify every town in the, in the, in the state, to densify it. So that we walk around, not drive as much. Right. And in some cities, that could work because there are flat streets, transit, there's you know services, and in some places it doesn't work. But this whole policy has been applied as one size fits all with no complaining. But out of that, some are affordable housing, right? But everything is based on average median income. When you think of what low income is, it's not what people think it is. One town will see some horrible development showing up that doesn't make any sense. It's in an area that is already very compromised for safety or traffic or part of their infrastructure, and they don't understand why it's happening. My guest today is Amy Kalish with Citizen Marine. Amy has been studying what the housing mandates are for different cities in California. Today, she's gonna to tell us what she's discovered and her concern of what's happening with California communities. That these are building built for profit, single family homes, for rent only. So they're kept off the market forever and whole neighborhoods do get bought up by corporations that then get turned into for rent only. What the state does is they bloat out the HCD budget, hire a lot of people to come and bother every city to see what they're doing. They write a ton of reports. Cities spend millions of dollars on paying consultants to write reports and none of that is going towards any kind of solution or housing. I'm Siamai Korami. Welcome to California Insider. Amy, it's great to have you on. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Amy, you have been studying uh, what's going on with housing, and you've kind of investigated what the state is doing with housing. There are these housing elements. The cities are supposed to build a lot of housing in California because we have this affordability crisis. Can you tell us more about your journey, what you've been doing? Uh, well, I first found out about this in 2020, and I was stunned that my tiny city was supposed to add a tremendous amount of housing. And I looked around and I couldn't figure out how they could do that uh, because we have fire hazards, we have FEMA floodplains, we have um, a sewer system that's not upgradable. It just seemed like it made no sense. So when things make no sense, I start looking into them. And um, sure enough, the city understood what all of the limitations were and they filed an appeal. All of the appeals in the state were rejected. So all of the cities that had limitations like ours that were very important and very real and should have been considered, the numbers had gone from in Mill Valley from like 140 to 865 since the last cycle. And then in Marin County, they went from 185 to 3,569. So it was like, we might have been building up to the point where we were supposed to over the last cycles, but suddenly things had gotten completely out of control. And the reason you know that they hadn't been built was because we have tremendous amount of hazards. We have a lot of um, you know, natural areas that need to be preserved. It wasn't prudent to build. And now we're being basically forced into doing this. So can you explain your city, uh, how many units do you have to build? You have to build 800, but out of that, some are affordable housing, right? It's 865 units total, but about 40% of them have to be market rate. And what we don't need is market rate housing in, in our city. It's, it's basically even the smallest house is already market rate at this point. There's like 20 buildable lots left in the city of Mill Valley. There's like 540 that are supposed to be low income or affordable, but everything is based on average median income. And in Mill Valley, in Marin County, it's very high. So like low income is like 90,000 to 130, 40,000, something like that. So when you think of what low income is, it's not what people think it is. So it will be a few thousand dollars a month on rent, something like that. That's it's 30% it's of whatever your income is. So 30% so like 2500 on average per month something like that. Right. And and when you mentioned the number of housing for a developer to develop 500 affordable housing they essentially have to develop another 2000 market rate housing, right? This well is the developer doesn't care. The developer has free reign to develop whatever they want. If they want to have concessions and bonuses that are given by the city and the state that are that are by law then they have to add a certain percentage of affordable housing. They don't have to add any. So every time a development occurs that doesn't have any, it doesn't count towards all of those affordable units that we need, but it takes up space and land. 
So if a developer wants to build something and adds 10%, let's say they build 100 units, and there's literally no place you can do that. But if they built 100 units and 10 of those were set aside as affordable, that 10 would count a, a, against it like 540 that we need. So we would have to do that if 540, at, you know, 10 at a time, we'd have to do that like 50 something times, you know, to get where they are. So just for that project, there, it, it's not, the whole city of Mill Valley would end up producing about 2,500 units just to cover the affordable units that are included in a small percentage into the market rate units. So market rate units get produced like 100 times over, sometimes like two or three times. In the in past, when you look it up, they're like 400 times what you needed for market rate. But always the below market rate numbers are, they're deficient in all three categories. So essentially what happens is when for your city to meet this requirement of developing about 800 units, which 500 something are affordable, they have to have a lot more development, right? Is it much higher number that has to be built, right? They would have to build a, m much more because only a few affordable units are put into each one. So essentially your city has to build, allow building like two to 3,000 units. Yes. And, and what size is your city? The population is about 16,000. It's considered built out. It's gridlocked. These, these streets were basically made by horses for horses in many cases. So they're very narrow and very curved. Um, they're not conducive to having any kind of massive growth. Um, our sewer system is very constrained. Um, there's a lot of hazards there, but this is a town that was built on logging in the 1890s. 1880s, 1890s. So when it got built out in the flatter areas, yeah, you have some grid-like areas that you can say are neighborhoods that are flat, which are also very prone to flooding, but it's a very difficult environment to build into because almost every lot is already locked up with something and a lot of it is housing. And can your city, so it seems like you, you must have less than 10,000 homes from, from the math you're saying. Usually it's 2.5. And now you have to add 3,000 more. So your city is going to grow by 30%. Is that it, possible? That is that, yeah. Supposedly the city will grow by 15% from the original number of 865. A as all cities supposedly are so suddenly, we need 15% growth across the board, which is not substantiated. But yes, it would have to grow by about 40% to make all of these numbers. And these numbers aren't, the cities don't build any of this. I mean, they're actually in Mill Valley, there's one development, 44 units that are affordable. And those will count towards that 540. Other than that, I guess, you know, the, the private market is supposed to provide those at basically a loss to them. Well, is the city growing? Do you guys have new people coming or what, no, what's the it's, plan? No, we've had like 1% growth forever, just like the rest of Marin County for these exact reasons. It's built out. It was considered built out by the fire department, the police department, the our waste department. Every department, if you look like five years ago, it's like considered built out in their documentation. And one of the things that I started looking at was, well, if we're supposed to have all these people move in, where are they going to get the water? So I went back to the water district records and I started looking at their plan for like the next 20 years and they had not incorporated any of this growth. They still considered it to be between 0.5 to 1.5% growth. And I'm like, how can they not be even paying attention to this in their most recent documents? So I wasn't seeing any planning for this. Um, I wasn't seeing any recognition of this at all except for the city understanding that they needed to get a document together that showed where this housing was going to go. And you dug in deeper, right, to go to look at different cities across California, because this is not just your city and county, right? No, I started looking at many cities. I read housing elements, which are the documents you're supposed to provide. I've read documents for maybe 30 or 40 cities by now, and they're, they're pretty dense. Most of the ones that I've read all filed appeals, for one thing, because they knew they couldn't you know, accommodate this kind of growth. A lot of them have the exact same problems that we have, and they're very concerned. They don't know how they're going to be able to cite this housing. The, the first part of the, the housing element is, is basically your, the city is making a contract with the state that they will cite this much housing, show you where you could cite this much housing. They will zone it. And then you have to zone it so that it would then 
be buildable in those areas. So that the rezoning occurs and it changes the way the city plans are and the countywide plans are because they have to upgrade all of their zoning and they upzone a lot of areas to allow more density per parcel. So that's how they're achieving a lot of it. But the worst part in our town is that one of the ways that you can add housing is to have underutilized space, which means all of your local businesses that are older, you have to remove those and replace them with housing. So in order to produce as much housing as they would need to produce in Mill Valley, we would lose a tremendous number of those businesses. And then basically we would just have housing. We have one small area that's historic that cannot be built as housing and the rest of it is pretty much open. So I'm very concerned that we are going to turn into a town of housing, which is not a town. Mostly apartments, right? Apartment Mostly, buildings. Well, these all have to be multifamily, yes. So um, now having a single family home is frowned upon. It's considered racist now to have a single family home. Areas are now being rezoned to not allow single family homes or to upzone for minimum density of minimum two units per parcel, and in many cases, a lot more than that. Why is it considered racist to have a single family home? Because um, different races live in these homes. Yes, they do. This is a hard one to, to explain because part of the housing element is to write a report about how you're going to solve all of the equity issues that have ever occurred with housing by integrating different ethnic groups that have been historically, you know, not able to afford houses into every community that has, and it's literally called pockets of white wealth. So if you own a house, um, you're somehow keeping things from someone else. To me, the obvious thing to do is if, the, if there have been people that have been unable to achieve how, you know, housing ownership or home ownership where they can create generational wealth is to help them do that because most people would like to live that way. And there, there, there are possibilities of still doing that, but that's not at all what this policy is about. It's about a renter society and a permanent renter society. Our California Insider team, we couldn't independently verify whether these state policies will create a renter society. While we see a lot of these new developments are rentals, and we have verified that, we've talked to some developers and the developers have told us that they want to keep a lot of these units as rental for at least 10 years because of lawsuits. We have also been hearing from state leaders, they're doing these housing mandates because they want to bring affordability, because we all know that we're in an affordability crisis for housing in California. We believe at California Insider that there is always 10 sides to a story. And we love to invite these state leaders to come on the show to tell us what their side of the story is. Now let's go back to Amy. Can you tell us more about your journey of finding out? So you found the housing element in your city, and then what did you do? I started reading uh, the laws that, um, first I went to the HCD website and tried to understand where these numbers were coming from. Um, they made no sense to me. I read all of the um, appeals from all the jurisdictions in my county, and they made sense to me, but yet they had all been rejected, which said to me that the state didn't care what the situation was. They were going to assign the numbers anyway. And all of the cities had appealed them? Most Two of the didn't. Uh, Novato and San Rafael didn't. I know Novato didn't because they didn't want to spend the money knowing that it would be rejected. It's been incredibly expensive and draining. It's taken two years out of, you know, sucked all of the air out of everything a city's done. Um, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars paid to consultants to put these reports together. Um, one of the components of the report, besides the actual housing element and putting, you know, citing housing and rezoning and doing that stuff, is um, an EIR. So you look at all the environmental concerns that you might have, and then you have to ignore them if you don't have enough space that can accommodate. And then you have the safety element, which in our case was, it was a disaster, and it was ignored as well because there is no way in Marin County, it was stated in the very first meeting um, at, for the Planning Commission and, and, board, and uh, board of Supervisors that we will not be able to avoid those areas. So I started watching all of the Planning Commission meetings. I watched all of the Board of Supervisors meetings. I wrote letters. I started to meet other people that were doing that. 
if I saw someone's letter, I'd find out who they were and I would hook up with them so we could talk. I started writing on Nextdoor every time I had new information and I would get tremendous response. Um, From not just other residents? Yes, and I have kind of become someone who puts out information, documented information, not my opinion, about what's going on. And I can answer questions that way and keep people informed. So I do, I spend hours a day actually doing that. And if people have questions, I answer their questions. And I'll do the research to answer those questions. Um, but now it's uh, other cities reach out to me for the same type of thing. And I, and I will help them with that. Are you concerned with stock market volatility? The market's closing in on their worst year since the financial crisis. Two of the major indices had their worst day since 2020. U.S. financial markets had their worst day since the start of the pandemic. Do you really trust this economy? Rumors are growing that the U.S. economy could be headed for a recession. Inflation soaring to its highest level in nearly 40 years. Prices for gas and groceries are so high. Inflation sending already sky-high prices soaring even higher across the board. What if you could invest in a portfolio with a higher fixed rate of return that's not correlated to the stock market? You can turn your monthly income on or off, compound it, whatever you choose, and there is no loss of principal if you need your money back. And absolutely, there are no fees. Just log on to investverify.com. Folks, I personally invest my own money with Verify. Log on to investverify.com or call 888-VERIFY24. Now let's go back to the interview. So you've been studying where these elements come from and then where have you got to so far? We have about 200 state laws that kind of contradict each other that are just basically created to completely contain any kind of protest that we might have legally. It's a bad situation for us because this all occurred basically during COVID when no one was paying attention to it and it was a creep that nobody noticed. So what I'm seeing is, um, you know, one town will see some horrible development showing up that doesn't make any sense. It's in an area that is already, you know, very compromised, you know, for safety or traffic or, you know, some other part of their infrastructure and they don't understand why it's happening and why their city is approving it. And so then that's the kind of, you know, someone will reach out to me and say, why is this happening? And then I'll say, well, you know, this is, um, you didn't, uh, last Rena, you didn't finish your whole cycle, so now this is an SB35 project where there's no CEQA involved. It's, you get ministerial approval for your project. You don't have to add parking to it. You have a tremendous amount of density. Um, and I explain why it's difficult for the city to actually have any say. That really blows people's minds because our city government um, is, they're the stewards of our towns and we are communities that of people that have been living together for a long time and have structured things the way that work very well in a responsible way. So responsible growth now is, is really not valued, I would say. Responsible growth has been replaced by for-profit developers making decisions that benefit them anywhere they want and you just live with the, with the consequences. And they don't have any aesthetic uh, that they need to follow. The, um, the standards that cities are given are objective. We can only judge things on objective standards. Do they meet code? Anything that used to be um, community preference for you know, the way something looked or the way something fit in is completely not allowed any longer. But the way that the state judges the cities and judges the housing elements is completely subjective. So you'll, you'll turn in a housing element thinking, oh God, it's finally finished. We only spent you know, $2 million on it, please. So this is when you planned where to put this housing? And yeah, you've finally shown it and then you've done your safety element. You've done, you've done all these plans that you can't even use, you, but you have to do them anyway. They cost a fortune. Um, you finish all of that and you turn it in and what you get back after, you know, maybe 150 days is something like, well, we like the way you did this, but um, you need to pay more attention in this area. And it's like a professor writing to you like, your term paper was okay, but you know, you really need to pay more attention in this area and then, re you know, send it back and I'll see what I say. 
there is no objective standard to what you are sending back to them. Do you have an example of this, of a city that did this that you saw? Marin County thought that they had everything locked up and when they sent their housing element on January uh, 31st, um, 2023. And it was rejected because the AFFH component was not considered to be fleshed out enough. And that's the affirmatively furthering fair housing. And that is the, um, the equity portion. So they weren't showing specifically how the city intended to make sure that the areas of white wealth that had been called out were going to accommodate new residents of color or people of what they call protected classes. And I don't still understand how, without being racist, you can actually create a plan like that, but you just keep submitting it until they finally are happy with that. And I think of the 539 localities in California that are you know, required to submit these plans, I think 330 of them are still out of compliance and it's largely due to not understanding how to put that part together. So the cities are supposed to plan for different races to come and get their units? That, that it's, a, it's a portion of what they're supposed to do, yes, to figure out how to make every community more inclusive, a more inclusive, vibrant community is how it's described, um, by especially identifying areas of opportunity, which are classified normally as areas where there's predominantly white wealth, and then making sure that someone is building a development there that has a few units that can be offered to people of color. I, it's very confusing because normally when you have affordable units, low-income units, there's a lottery system. People have been waiting a long time to you know, be able to get into a place where they, they get pulled out of a lottery. Yes, you finally found a unit. Might not be right where you live near, or near where you live, but you've, now you have been you know, offered this. So how do you then change that to favor one group over another? I'm still very confused about it. And I find the response from the state to the cities the letters I have read to be confusing. These are like nine page letters that sort of just kind of meander. Um, and that is the way that you find out that you haven't gotten a certified housing element. Eventually, most cities get one and they'll say, you know, you have a certified housing element, then you're no longer subject to um, builder's remedy, which is one of the, you know, the main. So what happens if you don't get that? You don't if get you, the certification. While, while you're out of compliance, so you've missed the deadline, you're subject to what's called builder's remedy, which is also referred to as a zoning holiday. So things can go from, you have a, you know, a neighborhood that's two to four stories, suddenly things are eight stories, or they're 12 stories, or you know, they're with no parking, and there's no parking already. Um, they're, but they're meant to be impactful penalty projects. So the way that cities have behaved in the past suddenly they're being judged as deserving of a penalty that hurts all of the residents of a town. We had no warning that any of this was coming. The first warning anyone had was when we got these new numbers, um, which people appealed in good faith, thinking oh, there must be some mistake, we can't accommodate this. But they're considered punishments and we deserve them. So essentially what you're saying is that if the cities don't meet these mandates, then they will actually have to let the builders come and build whatever they want. Yeah, so during, during that, that process between the time that they've you know, had a deadline and the time that they don't have, a, you know, don't have a certified housing element, they're subject to builder's remedy. But after mid-cycle, which is a four years into this whole process, there will be a review. And if you're found that you haven't made enough progress, your certification is revoked and you go right back into this process where you have to have builder's remedy. And now because a new law passed, SB 423, you're also subject again to SB 5, uh, 35. Um, and between those two, there's no room for actual responsible planning. We have also talked to Lydia Ko, who's the former mayor and current city council member at Palo Alto in California. She told us how these housing mandates are impacting city leaders like ourselves. 
also how they're impacting other communities across California. Here's a little bit of our conversation with her. I want to say 2017 or 2018, um, the state legislators started doing the planning and there were some laws that came out which changed how they uh, work the methodology of regional housing needs allocation. And so um, they changed the methodology on how to calculate. Um, so, for example, Palo Alto, in the fifth cycle of the housing element, we were um, allocated 1,988 units that we had to build in that eight-year period. And then in last year, our new housing element for the sixth cycle came forward, and um, we were allocated 6,068 uh, units that we have to build in the next um, eight years. That is four times or three times the amount increase, and there's no way that we're going to be able, we're going to be able to do that. So we're already set up to fail, and now with the builder's remedy in place, what they're going to do is so you're failing to get your numbers together. So now the door opens to developers to come in using the builder's remedy to say, because you didn't fulfill your numbers, now the state takes over and the state can grant those builder remedies. If your city was able to meet the mandate, what would happen? If your city actually was able to meet the mandate, but meet it perfectly, as in, you know, you have- All the, the components. The, all the, the components are one. met to the, to the number. Well, you'll be living in a different city entirely. Before we continue, we would like to thank Shen Yun for sponsoring this channel. It takes you back in time to magical world of ancient China with a unique blend of brilliant dancing, beautiful costumes, and legends coming to life. Go to ShenYun.com to find out the schedule and theater information. It's a lifetime experience you don't want to miss. Just so inspiring, it makes me want to go dance. Breathtaking. I was very impressed. I'm taking my program and I'm going to mention it on the news because I think it's a great performance and people should see it. What I loved about the show was the authenticity of it. It was taking me on a journey. Exceptional, the technique involved that, the thousands of hours of training. People just float. Everything was exact and then they worked to the exact moment and it was beautiful. You go away feeling with a smile in your heart from it. Have to come. Life-changing. Make sure you see it. Make sure you see it. Don't wait. Don't Get your tickets wait. now. So essentially what you're saying is that if your city was able to meet these mandates, they're going to build a bunch of luxury apartment units that you may not really need and a small number of affordable housing. Yes. We don't need any of the luxury housing. The other housing is... Yeah, affordable housing. That is in short supply because even though these areas used to be not as valued, um, it, they, were, they were just the, the place you know, near San Francisco that was beautiful, but it was a lot of um, middle-class families, teachers, firefighters, just normal people lived there and had small houses. The houses were very modest. And when you know, Silicon Valley kind of you know, grew and people were looking for a nice place to live, they would buy those houses at very high prices and then improve them make them very large and expensive. Um, so the demographic has changed over time. So we, there is no more uh, housing that is affordable. Um, if you go 10, 20 miles away, there, there are areas where you could build on land that is not as expensive. But this um, policy is kind of based around the concept of a 15-minute city, where you're not supposed to have to drive or go anywhere more than 15 minutes away from where you work or live or go to school. For that, you would have to start up completely from scratch. Um, you would have to have public transportation built into the way that your infrastructure you know, was developed. Um, none of these areas, they're old and they don't have that. So you have a lot of people that want a lot of services. They have gardener services. They, have, they want people to come clean their homes. Those people are coming from 10, 20, 30 miles away and they come in, they do their work, and then they leave. And for some reason, 
it's thought that, well, if we could just get them to live here, then they wouldn't need those cars. And I'm like, well, you know, they have, still can't go house to house without these cars. But also, having all of those people live there when they already potentially live in a community that suits them. They're just saying, oh, build it the same way, right? Uh, and they're, like I said earlier, deconstructing and deregulating big time. Um, but their fault is that they're not seeing that each city has its own um, uh, differences in terms of topography, in terms of envir in its built environment, what it's capable of doing. For example, I'll give you Yorba Linda in Southern California. They have a lot of oil wells, right? They, and so they can't build anywhere and everywhere because they have oil in underground and, you know, they have to be very careful about when they're digging, right? Uh, I'll tell you Pacifica or Half Moon Bay, um, they can't, they can't just go around building because they have mountainside where there's erosion from, from water. And then they have the coast where it's beaten up by the waves all the time. So you have to look at each city for what they are and the impacts. We have Woodside and Portola Valley and Los Altos Hills that are in the hills where there's a lot of uh, wood, a forest and so forth. So it's a high fire area, but the state treats it the same way as San Francisco or San Jose. So I, it, it's very wrong mentality when it doesn't look at individual cities for the uniqueness that they have and for the characteristics that they have. Uh, not so, you know, so I would want to say that, yes, it is faulty to think that we can build uh, every city to look like San Francisco. Now, when you, you started looking into this based on what you saw in your city and you guys, where you are, you have, to, if there's a fire, the, the roads have to be open for the infrastructure needs to be there for evacuation and you realize something doesn't add up. I could tell that something doesn't add up because where I live up on Mount Tam, if there's a mountain play, which is just a wonderful event that, you know, has several hundred people attend it, when that mountain play gets out and I want to leave my street and everyone's in a good mood, it takes me 20 minutes to let, have someone let me get into that street to let me feed onto the road I would need to use in an evacuation. So that's under the best of circumstances. If there was a fire, if there was adrenaline involved, if people were afraid for their lives, I think it would be much harder to get someone to let you into the road. So we're one road, there's hundreds of feeder roads, and some of those feeder roads are so deeply into the woods that I've lived there 35 years and I got lost recently. Um, and it was very difficult to find my way out. You'd come actually to a car this way and one of you would just have to keep backing up until you found a place that the other person could pass. And that's deep into the woods where that's happening. So if you're in a canyon that's on fire and that's occurring, there's no way that a car is going to be the way that you can leave. And if you leave on foot, you'd better have some kind of breathing apparatus with you. The insensitivity of assuming that putting a lot of density below an area that literally has no way to safely evacuate, to me, is criminal. And further, there was a grand jury report in 2019, it's quite thick, that shows all of these deficits. And to its credit, the county has done a tremendous amount of work to try to educate people about how to stay safe, what your emergency bag, your to-go bag looks like. But no matter what they do, the actual, the geographic limitations can't be fixed. Now, Amy, when you were looking into this, there was probably a moment when you realized like something is wrong with the picture and nobody's probably thinking about the ramifications of all these policies. How did that make you feel? What was that moment like? Oh, I couldn't sleep for months. I, j I, would, I was up all night thinking, how can this be happening? You know, like I was thinking, well, you could approach it this way, you could approach it that way. And it's like, no, you, in no way can you approach it in a way that makes sense. Your city is supposed to care about the safety of its residents. That's, they're not allowed to do that anymore. The state is supposed to care. They're making sure you're not safe. Um, and then additionally, you know, 
Mill Valley went the extra step to have Google do a, a simulation of an evacuation. They just re redid it in July, and the conclusion is that after three hours, my neighborhood is partially evacuated. If there is no fire and you just ask everyone to orderly get in one car per household and try to leave the area, and there's no tourist traffic, there hasn't been a tree that's fallen down across a road, nobody's panicking. So that gives you an idea of really, I mean, there at least 16,000 people up there. Um, and it stretches back beyond because Mill Valley goes up to one point, you go over the side, you have <clears throat> Muir Woods, Muir Beach, Stinson Beach, and a tremendous number of other small communities that may all need to use the same roads. We're all in the same, same position. It's extremely dangerous. You have to really think about your own safety because, and it's going to get worse. The traffic and this housing, if it occurs, is going to make it worse. So Amy, for you to, you, you got involved in this and you got really vocal and you've been researching this and why are you doing all this? It's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. I see the state, uh, I love this state. I've lived here almost every year of my life, but two years I lived, lived in California. And I, and I truly love the state. And this is a denigration of what we have accomplished here. I can't tolerate it. So the way that I go about it is spreading information. I don't use hyperbole. I don't get, you know, excited about, you know, like calling people names or anything like that. And one thing that was very helpful to me when I first started, and I was getting like a lot of trolls coming, you know, like at where I was writing, um, and, I, and I was about to answer them. I have a teenager who said, oh, mom, those are trolls. I'm like, what is that? Well, those are people who just love to bother you because they enjoy it. And I thought, well, huh, what can I do with this instead? And so what I use that for, whenever I get some kind of, you know, poke in, uh, in what I'm writing, I think, well, what if I answered this, not for the troll, but for all the other people who are reading what I'm writing and give a real answer? And that's what I do. And that's been very effective for me. Um, I've been able to reach a lot of people that way. You mentioned California is beautiful and, and you care about it. What do you think would happen to California if, if these laws, just ev everything that's planned goes through? Um, well, especially since SB 423 passed last year, uh, this will all extend to the coast. So coastal areas will, that have not been um, subject to density can have very large, very large dense projects built on them if they haven't made their previous cycle or if they lose their housing element certification. So that means, you know, coastal towns that right now the Coastal Commission decides if it's a good idea or not or if they have the infrastructure to do it. The Coastal Commission will now be overridden. That's, that is what the new law says. And additionally, the amount of affordable housing that has to be involved in a project like that dropped down to 10%. So things got worse and the amount of affordability went down and there's nothing to make these new units not just someone's second home or third home, you know, just bought up and kept vacant. Like in San Francisco, there's 55,000 units right now that are just owned and unoccupied. Um, because they're held as investments. So no matter how much you're building, um, it doesn't necessarily help any part of the population if it's being you know, used as a commodity. Um, I see the end of responsible planning. When I look at the Planning Commission and I watch their hearings and I see how carefully they think about all of the impacts a project would have and they try to mitigate that, I'm on a design review board that does the same thing in um, the area that I live where projects come in. We're not allowed to touch multifamily projects anymore, just single family. But we work with the community around that project and say, well, how is this going to impact you? What can we do to bring both parties together? The neighbors are there, the person who wants to build a house is there to make everybody happy. And we do our best to accommodate that. Well, no one's going to be doing that anymore. That's over. So. Some cities are disbanding their planning commissions, and definitely their design review boards are gone. 
because so many projects have to be pre to to be approved ministerially, which is mean automatically. Someone just comes to the counter, and the the counter staff can do it. It's it's at, it, that is literally ad hoc planning. That means just things popping up everywhere that make no sense. And they don't have to look anything. They can look stack and pack like what you're seeing up and down everywhere. It's all going to look like that. And we have, California has had a heritage of small towns that have a lot of character. And I believe that it's a beautiful thing to have small towns with character. And that character has been demonized as something it's not. It's the nature of the built environment and how we handle that. Um, it's not racist, it's not exclusionary, it's just a preference of a community to look and feel a certain way. And if you want to be small and you want to live out into in a more you know, country-like area, you should be able to do that. And that's, I see that as being something that will be taken away. Do you think we're going to lose this sense of community from these small towns? Do you think that will disappear? There is a concerted effort to actually take that away. Um, it's very offensive to me. Um, community, the, the three things that were mentioned when all of this policy started that were, that were considered inhibitions to housing. So all the, inhibi in the inhibitors to housing needed to go away. The first one was zoning. The second one was CEQA, and the third one was community input. So community input means there's no notice to the community when something like this gets approved. There are no site polls. They try to keep it as quiet as possible, and it just shows up. You have no idea it's even happening. I find that not to be democratic. I find that to be undermining of our local democracy. It is eviscerating any kind of legitimacy that a community can possibly have. You have no control over your future. It's being controlled uh, top down by a state that clearly is one size fits all is good for them. Um, it makes no sense to me. It, it, it's anathema to what California has been. When we have all these kind of housing, especially rentals, uh, what it does, what they want to cause is for circulation. So people are saying, the the people who are doing the um, deconstructing our zoning and land use laws, the people that are really believing in um, dense building, they want circulation. So what they're saying is that when a person moves into some place, you shouldn't live there forever. You should leave at some point so someone else can come and live over there. So yes, Amy is correct. You know, with that kind of thinking. Um, ideology what they're saying is you know we're not they're what they're not thinking about is that when people move into a community and when they have ownership in what they have they tend to invest in their community investing in their community doesn't only mean putting money into a community yes we go shopping so tax dollars are developed revenues are generated for that city but also people volunteer they volunteer within their community in meals uh, on wheels they serve meals for seniors they help seniors get around um, there's so many things ptas you know parent teacher associations we've uh, when my kids were young, we were like right there at teacher associations and joining your neighborhood association, being part of that neighborhood. Those are some of the investments that a lot of people, when they when they have ownership in their community, then they give back. When you're when you're just, uh, you know, we have long term renters in Palo Alto also that have stayed long long time, but then there's also a lot that just comes and goes, and you know, they're not going to be developing the community. And we see more and more, there's a larger majority that just comes and goes. So Amy is right, we have less community building. Amy, you have been studying this for a while. Is there a way for these cities to solve the affordability problem? What we used to have in California is uh, redevelopment agencies. And those started in like 1945 and they went until 2012. And that was a city-state cooperative program where cities would identify areas that were perfect for redevelopment, 
the development would occur for low-income workforce, uh, individual f and families. They were offered decent rents to stay there. So the areas weren't gentrified. They were actually stabilized. They were nice. What occurred then was then there was a, a reason for industry to build up around them for you know different kinds of markets to appear. Um, it raised the value of the property enough where the cities were getting more taxes from that. So there was kind of a, you know, a cycle that was working. And there were some cases where it didn't work really well, but there's a tremendous number of cases where it worked in California all those years. And in 2012, Governor Brown shut those down because he had tried to take money from those programs and use it for other stuff because the, he had a budget deficit and the cities com complained. They said, that is our money that you're supposed to use, supposed to come back to us. So there was an argument and that ended the program. In one day, he just shuttered it and nothing has replaced it. Um, and the, the state doesn't build. So this, what the state does is they bloat out the HCD budget, hire a lot of people to come and bother every city to see what they're doing. They write a ton of reports. Um, they're having cities spend millions of dollars on writing reports, paying consultants to write reports. And none of that is going towards any kind of solution or housing. That's just going towards kind of just a spinning machine that is non-productive. And do you have any other thoughts for Californians? Everybody better wake up. Um, I mean, there's enough organizations popping up everywhere. I just was in touch with one in Monterey. They're very interested. There's no end of cities waking up and realizing this is happening. So what are they going to do? There are a bunch of organizations they can join, but unless we actually have one organization that is doing our PR the way EMB does for that other side of what we're wondering about, that, which is uh, abundant housing no matter what, um, we need to get our message out. And without putting one organization together that can do that kind of PR and outreach, we're not going to be able to make too much of an impact. And that's something I'm working on this year. So right now my organization is Citizen Marin, citizenmarin.org. Um, but I am spreading out to Citizen California and it will be citizenca.org. And I want that to be um, a site not just to inform people, but to give people um, a way to get involved and to start doing things like what Catalyst did with Lobby Day, where there's more interaction with lawmakers, more interaction with people that need to understand what's going on. And, you know, if we need to take to the streets, we'll, we'll do that. But I think we can change, to change the narrative and to get the people that are in our legislature who don't understand what the second and third order of what they're doing right now will do to California is really important. I don't take any money for what I do. This is all just completely, you know, my, my gift or whatever. This is my donation of time, and I spend about 60 hours a week doing this. And I have for several years now. And when I do Citizen CA, that will be an organization that will actually need to raise funds so that we can have professional PR and lobbying and raise, you know, continue to raise funds and have a self-perpetuating agency. So. Amy Kalish with Citizen Marine. It was great to have you on California Insider. Thank you. It's nice to be here. We have an exciting news for you. At California Insider, we created a new product. It's called California Insider Opinion. This is where our insiders and experts across the state are actually telling you what's going on behind the headlines. When there is a breaking news, a big issue, important issue happening in California, they're going to come on the screen and tell you what's happening behind the scenes. And these are like seven to ten minutes of opinion formats where the guests are talking to the camera directly telling you what's happening. You're paying a tax increase of tens of thousands of dollars every year as a condition of keeping what you already own. Make sure to look at the description below because you want to sign up on our newsletter because a lot of these opinions might be very sensitive that some people in the social media platform may not like. So we're putting them in the newsletter on our website so you can have them. These opinions will actually help you understand the political 
and policy landscape of California. We highly recommend you follow it.